Hey, somebody's gonna shuck the oysters? <laughs> you already have? Excellent. Good morning, afternoon, or evening. You are listening to the professional noticer. You understand what I'm saying? Here, you and I will use common sense and all the wisdom we can muster to move beyond what is true and go all the way to the truth. Creating measurable results for people like you and families like yours, I am the professional noticer. Thank you very much, sir. You're a gentleman and a scholar. Hello, everyone. I'm Andy Andrews. Hey, thank you for making me a part of your week. I know our topics seem to vary wildly, but it's just because the things you care about most are often greatly affected by the things you care about least. We're getting to the bottom of the pool. We're noticing things, and so we feel questions about business and spiritual issues and popular culture, and we tackle the odd conundrum like, what is the most efficient way to dig yourself out of that hole you're in if you only have a pair of chopsticks? <laughs> Come on, MacGyver. My purpose here today and with every show we do is to play the part of a best friend or coach. I want to help you live the, the life you would live if all your toughest questions were answered. Our sponsor this week, the Kamado Joe Premium Ceramic Grills. These are my grills. I was just grilling last night. You know, I've had other grills in my lifetime. For a long time, I had the kind my daddy used when I was growing up. Remember that? You know, put a bunch of gas in there, flip a match in. Oh, there's the mushroom cloud across the Andrews backyard. Yeah, you know, everybody knew we were having work. Then we had a gas grill. Then we had a Kamado style grill. But some years ago, there was a realization a couple of guys had about grilling. They loved it, and they knew it had to be a better way. And as it turned out, these guys had the ability that allowed them to design and develop the best Kamado style grill that exists. It's the Kamado Joe. All its sizes, all its specialized tools. I was using the Joe Tisserie last night. The world's best ceramic cooker. It's, it's, I'm telling you, you may look at it and say, oh, that's just like, no. <laughs> it's a very different. KamadoJoe.com. Or look for a dealer near you. Hey, observations and answers. That's what we do here. I deliver the observations, but you are the question part of this equation. Questions are a critical component of the person that you and I aspire to become because the quality of our answers in life can only be determined by the quality of our questions. So we you know, try to ask good questions so we can find some good answers. You ask good questions and you dig in. You find little different areas. You can, you, can, you, you can climb your way or dive your way to the bottom of the pool and find the foundation, find the answers. And... This week we have a question from Adam. He is in Israel. Let's listen. Hey Andy, I would first I would like to thank you for all your books. I read all of them and they really have had a great effect on me. The Noticer will always be my favorite though. I must have read it 15 times. Here's my question. I'm dorming in Israel and a couple of weeks ago a homeless person knocked on my door. He asked for a place to stay the night. Since we were on vacation and I was the only one in the dorm, I happily obliged. He left the next morning and I gave him a pair of sweatpants and a can of tuna to go. Having been homeless yourself, how would you recommend helping a homeless person? Do you think food, clothing, money, or even a conversation is most helpful? And how can we try to create more of an awareness and a willingness to help amongst the people of the world? Thank you so, so much. Adam, thank you very much for this question. You know, this is a question that uh, I'm sure you already know, the, this uh, topic is near and dear to my heart. So is your name, by the way. I have a son named Adam. Adam is our second son. But I told him, just so that you know, since your name is Adam, I told him one day, I said, Adam, you know your name is God's favorite name. He said, really? I said, absolutely. 
He said, how do you know? He said, because the first man was named Adam. And uh, I guess God could choose from any name he had to choose from. There's all these names. And the very first one he chose was Adam, so it must have been his favorite name. So, you know, there you go. So, Adam, thanks for the question about the the, the homeless. He's a homeless person knocked on your door, asked a place to stay the night. He, you know, you had a place. You only won and left the next morning. You gave him a pair of sweatpants, a can of tuna. He was pretty happy. Good for you. That's, um, I mean, good. That was great. Uh, and you said, I haven't been homeless yourself. How would you recommend helping a homeless for a way? You did a pretty good job of it. Right there. I took some notes while you were talking. You said, do you think food, clothing, money, conversation are helpful? Yeah, absolutely. All of them. Food, clothing, money. A conversation. They're all incredibly helpful. How can we try to create more of an awareness and willingness to help among the people of the world? Boy, now there's a big, there's a big job. How can we create a willingness? How can we create? A willingness amongst the people of the world. All right, let's get to the bottom of pulling this. First, you got the people of the world. <laughs> how many of them? Matt, how many people in the world? Do you know? Look it up. Look it up real quick. Can you for me? There's got to be a lot of people in the world. Billions and billions, as Carl Sagan would have said. 7.53 billion 7.53 billion with a b okay so here we have adam we have these people of the world <sighs> how can we create a willingness okay now i gotta tell you something Adam, I'm kind of playing with you here because I'm leading you down an odd trail. Because you're right. You you said, um, having been a homeless person yourself, or actually what you said was having been homeless yourself, and, and you're absolutely right. I mean, uh, there was almost two years there that I lived under a pier, and I was in and out of people's garages, and you know, I slept in the sand, hidden where people didn't know I was under that pier and you know I mean that was before anybody was even talking about homeless people I mean I mean honest to God I'm six what I'm 60 years old 60 minus 23 Matt help me again 60 minus 22 60 minus 22 30 so 38 years ago Adam 38 years ago Nobody, you can look it up, nobody was talking about homeless people. That wasn't even a topic. It wasn't even a word. N nobody had, nobody, nobody talked about a homeless problem because nobody, there was not a word called homelessness. And so, obviously, back then, even though I was sleeping on the beach and under the pier and in some empty garage occasionally, I never considered myself homeless. Why would I consider myself homeless? There wasn't even a thing called homeless. You know? I was 22. I'm single. I'm relatively good looking. On a scale of 1 to 10, I could peg myself at a 6.5 with a tan and the long blonde hair. I didn't have any real responsibilities. I was working. I was... Uh, catching fish, cleaning fish, catching bait, selling bait, selling fish, taking people fishing, washing boats, and I had cash, and I slept under a pier, and uh, I never thought of myself as homeless. I was just living on the beach. You know, there was no internet. There were no cell phones. My parents were dead. All these people who 
<clears throat> would have been horrified that I was sleeping in her pier. <laughs> they didn't have any clue. They didn't have. They didn't have any idea. They didn't know. And so I didn't have to tell them. And they didn't have to help me. And I wasn't homeless because there was not a thing called homeless. I was living on the beach. And literally years later, literally, maybe 20 years later, I'm talking about this to a friend and just kind of talking about that time and telling about how I used to get bait and where I would sell it and how I would go to people and I'd say, hey, where are you from? And they would have this sparkly boat and on the trailer and they'd come from Nashville and I I guess I could see I could see a Tennessee tag on it. I said, we're from, oh we're from Tennessee. Are you down here on vacation? Yeah, we're down on vacation. Man, it's a beautiful boat. A beautiful yeah, it's no boat. So now where where are you where are you going? Where are you going? What are you how are you fishing around here? Oh, we're just gonna put in over at the state park and so where are you gonna go? I'm not really sure yet. Oh say, no wait a minute. Let me just ask you this. Is it, is it possible that you have a boat and you don't know where to fish? And they would say, well, yeah, that's pretty much us. I said, what a coincidence. I live here. I know where to fish, but I don't have a boat. What an incredible match. For $100, I'll take you fishing. And if we don't catch fish, you ain't going to give me nothing. And we're just having a good time, okay? Man, I always get paid. You know, I was a homeless person, I, but I didn't know I was homeless. I actually had a great time. But 20 years later, I'm telling people about this, and I'm talking about this, and sleeping under the pier, and, you know, how I would go to sea and suds, and for a dollar, Nancy would, you know, she'd buy my fish, and she would take the flounder I'd caught, and for a dollar, she'd fry my flounder, and she'd give me iced tea, I, hush puppies, all the crackers I could eat for a dollar. And buy the flounder that I had extra. And my friend 20 years ago said, I mean, 20 years later and 20 years ago, my friend said, dude, seriously? I was like, did you like, you like had like food stamps and stuff? And for a second, I paused there and I went, um, no. But it, my mind is whirling. In my mind, I'm thinking, I could have. I guess I could have. And my friend said, but you'd like, you got like checks, you know, welfare checks. You got that? And I was like, mm, no. And my mind is whirling. I'm thinking, I guess I could have. And my friend says, seriously, dude, you're like, you're like homeless. And I sat back for a second. I think, well, you know, I guess I was. My parents were dead. I didn't have any money. I slept under a pier. I didn't have a car. I was homeless. So I just, you know, I was homeless. And it was curious. I wrote about that in the noticer. But then, you know what you say here, Adam? Having been homeless yourself, you know, I found myself... Uh, years later, in front of a camera, I'm on CNN, I'm on Fox News, I'm on Good Morning America, and I'm on these different shows. And just about every time for a while there, they would introduce me and they say, formerly homeless, now a New York Times best-selling author, and somewhere in that three and a half minutes, you just watched every single time somebody was saying, Andy, I one final question. Having been a homeless person yourself, what advice do you have for the homeless of today? Adam, honest to God, all I could think, sometimes I think, um, leave New York City? <laughs> I want to say, Get out of Philadelphia. I, you know, I, I wanted to say that. I want to say, move south. I mean, you, you know, I'm sitting there. I, I kind of, you know, I know what is expected of me. I know what is, so I'm answering what I'm saying, what is expected of me. Well, 
<clears throat> and I'd like to encourage the homeless people today and just understand that there are things that you can do and there are people that will help and there is more. I mean, I said all the things I read, but in my mind, I'm screaming, dude, get out of here. What are you doing? What are you doing? There's a million homeless people on the streets of New York City. Just I move to a small town in Arkansas. You'll be the only homeless person there. There will be churches that will compete to give you food. They, I mean, I mean, people will go out of their way to help you. You'd be the only homeless person there. And in fact, forget Arkansas. Move to uh, Crestview, Florida. You'll be the only homeless person there, and it's warm. But see, here's what those people didn't know, and there's here's what I really never considered at the time. When I was homeless, there was no pathology there. I wasn't. I was not addicted to anything. You know, I didn't have an alcohol problem. I didn't use drugs. I didn't, uh, you know, I, 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 there was no uh, pathology as far as a mental issue. You know, I was not handicapped in some way. My, my, you know, my thinking was fairly sound. And so... I was just a 22-year-old who didn't have enough money and hadn't found a good enough reason to go figure out a way to earn enough money to sleep somewhere else besides in the sand. And there came a point when I had that desire and I... I had figured out, you know, some of the steps that it would take, and and I had been nice to some people through the, those years. I'd been nice. I'd helped. I'd made myself valuable. And so when I stepped up and reached out, they helped me. So here's what I want to tell you, Adam. You have been given a gift of mercy. You see these homeless people, and you have a gift of mercy. And with that gift comes a responsibility. You have a responsibility to care for and to, to figure out and to help. And this is what you're seeking to do. But I want to I caution you, because everybody has gifts, Every single person has a gift, and with that gift, remember you saw Spider-Man, with that gift comes responsibility. Now, <clears throat> the larger the gift, the larger the responsibility, but the responsibility is equal to that giftedness, and there is a measure of responsibility that you are, you know, quote-unquote, responsible for. However, when you take on more responsibility than you have been given grace to perform with, you know, you got this gift of mercy, you, you feel this responsibility, and you have been given responsibility. You do. You do need to help. You need to figure out. You need to help some people, all right? Um, but be careful because you've been given the grace to perform that responsibility according to your giftedness. And you, you can do it great and you can do it stress-free. You can do it and your family won't think you're a crazy person. You can do it and people won't shy away from you. You can do it and be great. But I want to tell you something, buddy. If you once you start going, you know, I need to help everybody. I got to help them all. And you start gathering more responsibility than you have been given. Well, that's on you. And the weight finally, at some point, will collapse you. 
And so how do we create a willingness among 7.53 billion people in the world? Adam, that's not your responsibility, as crazy as it may seem. To say this, all those people in the world are not your responsibility. You have been given a gift, and you've been given amazing abilities according to that gift, and responsibilities that you should respond to according to those abilities. And But, dude, you're not responsible for every people in the world. And if you mentally become responsible for everybody in the world, and you're thinking about everybody in the world, and all you think about is all these people in the world, you know what's going to happen to your family? You can drive them into a ditch. And all you're trying to do is what you're supposed to do. (sighs) How do you know the difference? If you head into stress and trouble and follow a pathway of peace, what feels right, what feels necessary. Are you supposed to go to the ballpark? Yeah, you are. Are you supposed to work for homeless people 24 hours a day? Hey, Hey, Adam, that is not your responsibility. Okay, I'm Andy Andrews, the professional noticer, harnessing common sense and wisdom to plow through challenges all the way to an answer for you. Don't forget Wisdom Harbor, wisdomharbor.com, measurable results, a new web portal. People all over the world are using this. Amazing, seventeen dollars a month, but you can go wisdomharbor.com, take a free five minute guided tour. It is unbelievable, and I. I think that will do it for this week. Get us out of here, Matthew. So, ladies and gentlemen, and to the boys and girls who aspire to become ladies and gentlemen, we have reached the end of another episode of The Professional Noticer. In a world where common sense has become a superpower, hey, I'm just harnessing the little bit of mental energy I have. This is just for us, your family, my family. We're just trying to seek some wisdom, make some observations, and endeavor to answer some tough questions in a way that will empower your family and your business. I'm Andy Andrews. Until next week, smile while you talk, shake hands with the kids you meet, and make sure you have an answer to the question, how do you make one plus one equal three? (laughs) And so until next week, goodbye. This episode of The Professional Noticer was produced by Matt Limpert, the Noticer theme written and performed by Sugar Cane Jane. Swedish Fish, provided by Twinkle and Smoke of Beverly Hills. Additional financial consideration, provided by DerivingFromDerivatives.com. DerivingFromDerivatives.com is a website you can visit to be informed and an organization that you will want to support. Your time is important. You should not have to decide whether or not you're getting the real thing or just some brainless creation sucked from the life form of the original that was better. Yes, you loved Johnny Carson. Then they forced Jay Leno on you. NBC pushed Jay Leno aside and brought you Conan O'Brien. Conan was the derivative from a derivative. Soon, of course, it was decided that the original derivative was better than the derivative from the derivative. And we had Jay Leno again. Now the network has moved to a permanent derivative from a derivative. (laughs) We have Jimmy Fallon, who, on the whole, is a pretty great derivative. Hey, remember All in the Family? Maud was Archie Bunker's cousin. Then, when Maud's made Florida, got a few laughs, we got good times. The dynamite derivative from a derivative. Ever considered the lineage of Tide detergent? Tide begat cheer, and cheer begat the derivative from a derivative. It was called gain. But wait, gain begat Bold. So bold was, in fact, a derivative from a derivative of a derivative. But there's more. 
Have you ever considered how often you purchase a new dog collar? It's not just a once-in-a-lifetime thing, you know.